Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured. But the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In the second part of his work, The Myth of Sisyphus, Albert Camus will provide three sketches of what he calls examples that show us how an ethics of quantity in the face of the absurd would play itself out. And the second of these is that of the actor. And we could extend this, it's worth thinking about, into actors in other frameworks. So he thinks about the person on the stage as the paradigm. We could think about whether this applies to other forms of performance where there is an impersonation, an embodiment of a character. Could this apply to film, television, streaming, to other things as well? Or when a professor is taking the role of Plato or Descartes or Mary Wollstonecraft. Is something similar going on here as they are impersonating that actual, you know, philosopher who they're, they're taking on as a character. Now, uh, when we look at this section, it's titled in English drama, the French title, for it is a little bit more restrictive, but also a bit more, let's say, suggestive. It's la comédie, right? So comedy is a kind of drama, but it also can be a stand-in for the absurd condition of our life. But it could also be a reference to something like the divine comedy, although Camus is going to talk about the Catholic Church's condemnation of actors in just a bit. So we've got drama and the actor. And he's going to say a little bit into this that um, never has the absurd been so well illustrated or at such length as, as what? So he says, why should we be surprised to find a fleeting fame built on the most ephemeral of creations? The actor has three hours to be Iago or Alcest, Fade or Gloucester. In that short space of time, he makes them come to life and die on 50 square yards of boards. And then we get this, never has the absurd been so well illustrated. So this is a paradigm or at such length. And he goes on to say, what more revelatory epitome can be imagined than those marvelous lives, those exceptional and total destinies unfolding for a few hours within a stage set? There is something in intrinsically artificial about anything that is portrayed on the stage. We don't see, except in very realistic drama, and even then it's just a tiny little slice. We don't see the entirety or even more than a little portion of the character's life, and if they die, their death, there is a kind of selectivity to it. Interestingly, just a little bit after that, he is going to bring up the ethics of quantity. And he says, if ever the ethics of quantity finds sustenance, it is on that strange stage uh, what it is that the actor is engaged with. So let's go back to the very beginning of this section. He begins by talking about Hamlet. Of course, everybody talks about Hamlet. And then he says that the everyday person does not enjoy tarrying, lingering. Everything on the contrary hurries him forward, but at the same time, nothing interests him more than himself, especially his potentialities. Now notice the transition here whence his interest in the theater, in the show, where so many fates are offered him, 
where he can accept the poetry without feeling the sorrow. And so what is Camus talking about here? A kind of identification or slipping into a character or perhaps multiple characters by the audience member who is in a certain sense participating in the play through a passive receptivity to it, but also extending something out there into what is going on, what is being portrayed, what is being offered by the actor. So here is where he's going to say the absurd person begins where the thoughtless person leaves off. And so who is going to be the absurd person? Well, it could be an audience member, but it's definitely going to be the actor, or at least possibly be the actor. So he says the um, absurd person begins where that one leaves off. We're ceasing to admire the play. The mind wants to come in. It is our thinking about things that renders matters absurd or allows them to be revealed as absurd. And how so? He says, entering into all these lives, experiencing them in their diversity amounts to acting them out. So it is possible as the audience member to do that. But in a certain sense, the actor gets to do that more fully. And what it is the audience member has, even if they're an actor watching the performance, is sort of just a pale imitation of that. And now Camus is going to specify something here. He says, I'm not saying that actors in general obey that impulse, that they are absurd people, but that their fate is an absurd fate. So not all actors are the absurd, but some of them are, and all of them are caught up within this dynamic that has the potential for that. So he says, let's establish this order to grasp without misunderstanding what will follow. The actor's realm is that of the fleeting, and he uses the word ephemeral here, which literally means of a day. And he says that um, of all kinds of fame, theirs is the most ephemeral, but all fame is ephemeral, right? I mean, you can be famous for years and years. This is worth dwelling on as well. If you become famous, It's not you who has become famous. It is some sort of composite image of you, not the person who you actually are. Even if you're like a reality star and you do things here and it gets, you know, photographed by the paparazzi and talked about in the tabloids and put onto TV shows, it's still not entirely you. And if you're famous for having done something important, writing a a book like, you know, Camus has, Well, the you that has that fame, perhaps for a long, long time, and we're still talking about Plato today or Socrates, it's not you, right? It is something else in a way. It's it's an imitation, a character. And so he goes on and he says that The actor has chosen multiple fame, the fame that is hallowed and tested. From the fact that everything is to die someday, he draws the best conclusion. An actor succeeds or does not succeed. A writer has some hope, even if he's not appreciated. He assumes his works will bear witness to what he was. At best, the actor will leave us a photograph and nothing of what he was himself, his gestures and his silences, his gasping or his panting with love will come down to us. And we might say, well, wait a second. What if we video recorded a performance or even just have audio of it? And you could say, yes, yes, that's, there's something there, right? So maybe Camus is overstating this a bit and maybe our own time offers new possibilities because we video record everything. <laughs> but... It is ephemeral creation, and as we talked about, there's this very short space of time. You get to be Iago for three hours, or, you know, if you're in a longer play, maybe uh, a bit longer, uh, but you can only hold so much attention from the audience, and you're on a small stage, and that is where the character who you are taking on lives and dies. And so he's going to use a number of different terms for the relationship between the actor 
and the character. He talks about identifying, right? He says that uh, to what degree the actor benefits from characters is hard to say. That's not the important thing. It's a matter of knowing how far he identifies himself with those irreplaceable lives, the lives that have been written for them that they have decided to take on and make their own. He says, it often happens he carries them with him, that they somewhat overflow the time and space in which they were born. I mean, if you want to be a good actor, you don't just turn it off as soon as you exit the stage. You're carrying the, that character, who is the character of your current play, with you. And he does use that term, carrying, as well, bearing, right? Um, in, in that. They, they accompany the actor who cannot very readily separate himself from what he has been. Occasionally, when reaching for his glass, he resumes Hamlet's gesture of raising his cup. And then he goes on and he talks about simulating. What is his art? To simulate absolutely, to project himself as deeply as possible into lives that are not his own. I mean, you could do a one-person play that's really about you and it's totally autobiographical. That would be sort of at one, you know, outlying extreme. Most of the time as an actor, you are portraying other people. Even if you're just doing a commercial for orange juice, right? And you're sipping it and you're like, ooh, this is good, right? For 30 seconds and you're smiling and all that, you're acting. You're, you're taking on a, a character. The guy who just poured himself a, a glass of orange juice from the refrigerator and is turning to their partner and saying, I'm so glad you bought this, or something along those lines. And so with all of this, he tells us that what an actor is doing it, with all of, all of these, these sort of impersonation things is enacting something where appearing creates being. It's not that the characters are, you know, just figments of our imagination and then we have their representation. They have a certain being within the actor. Camus is not going to call this possession or anything like this. But then notice the next thing that he is going to talk about. He says the actor trains and perfects himself only in appearances, and how does, they, how does this happen? He says the theatrical convention is that the heart expresses itself and communicates itself through gestures and in the body or through the voice, which is just as much of the soul as of the body. The rule of that art insists that everything must be magnified and translated into flesh. He says, if it were essential on the stage to love as people really love, to employ that irreplaceable voice of the heart, to look at as people contemplate in life, our speech would be in code. But here, silence must make themselves heard. And he says, not everybody can be theatrical in this way. Not everybody can figure out a way to render, as we sometimes say, larger than life, the, the gestures, the tone of voice, the physiognomy that's required to convey things. And sometimes this can become quite stereotyped, right? You think about, for example, the use of sound effects or uh, explosives or things like that that are nothing like what they are. You know, in so many movies and TV shows, we have a single hawk sound that stands in for all of them. You could think about love scenes in, in movies when they're not very realistic. You know, there's many things that could be complained about that way. But this is also part of the necessity. If you're going to have a, a battle on stage, it can't be realistic because you'd be killing everybody within you know, 30 seconds of the beginning of, of combat. It's gotta be flashy. As a matter of fact, I can tell you, just from my own background knowledge about this, that uh, doing martial arts and doing stage combat are two very different fields 
and doing the one can actually make it more difficult for you to do the other properly and vice versa unless you're very talented and spend a lot of time on these and can kind of split these apart from each other very much like two very different genres of music right so the body and the voice everything must be translated into flesh he talks about great drama as involving uh, passions on stage in bodily form and gesture and he says that the actor allows the passions to rush onto their stage they speak in every gesture they live through shouts and cries the actor creates his characters for display he outlines or sculptures them and slips into their imaginary form transfusing his blood into their phantoms and this is what happens in great drama and so you know he says that the next thing the scale of the human body is inadequate it doesn't suffice for what's being demanded and yet now notice the term that he uses here be because something happens an absurd miracle right now this is very interesting because who else talks about miracles and the absurd in this way somebody who Camus has actually eventually dismissed in this work as an existentialist Kierkegaard right so by an absurd miracle he says the body is able to bring knowledge the mask the buskin the makeup the costume the universe sacrifices everything to appearance through an absurd miracle the body brings knowledge I should never really understand Iago unless I played his part it's not enough to hear him for I grasp him only at the moment when I see him of the absurd character he says the actor has the monotony the single oppressive silhouette simultaneously strange and familiar that he carries from hero to hero so excuse me there is a very important corporeality to this and and that makes sense because we are corporeal beings we're not just beings of ideas and here before this this subsection ends he's going to talk about an absolute contradiction and an absurd contradiction and what is that so the actor contradicts himself the same and yet so various so many souls summed up in a single body the individual wants to achieve everything and live everything but it also is a contradiction that doesn't stop us from doing anything right why because what contradicts itself joins in him we are the locus of contradictions we are where the contradictions are not necessarily resolved but reside and that is what the actor is doing here Camus will bring up a little bit of history that we may have actually forgotten about he says how could the church have failed to condemn such a practice on the part of a, the actor she repudiated in that art the heretical multiplication of souls the emotional debauch the scandalous presumption of a mind that objects to living but one life and hurls itself into all forms of excess eternity is not a game right and he's, he's got this great line between everywhere and forever there is no compromise so the actor is always suspect because they're kind of you know from the the perspective of the church they're false but they're not just false in that they're impersonating somebody they could be impersonating many somebodies over the course of their life so who actually are they who is the subject in this case well that's what makes them suspicious and up for condemnation and he's got this very interesting example of Adrienne uh, Le Couvreur on her deathbed willing to confess and receive communion but refused to abjure her profession therefore her confession is no good and what was she choosing between heaven and a ridiculous fidelity fidelity to what to her art and he, he goes on and he says this was actually her finest role and the hardest one to play sort of a a higher level role that of being the actress right and so this is going to be a part of the ethics it's a way of showing 
revolt in the absurd. And he goes on and he says, the actor knew what punishment was in store for them, right? Um, to the actor is the absurd person, a premature death is irreparable. If you have an ethics of quantity, you want to have as much life as you can. Why? Nothing can make up for the sum of faces and centuries he otherwise would have traversed, but you have to die. For the actor is doubtless everywhere, but time sweeps him along and makes its impression with him, and he calls this the actor's fate. It is in time, he says, that he makes up and enumerates his characters. It is in time that he learns to dominate them. The greater number of different lives he's lived, the more aloof he can be from them. But all of this happening in time consumes time, sweeps us along through time. And he talks about the time coming when he must die to the stage and for the world. He feels the harrowing and irreplaceable quality of that adventure. He knows and now can die. So you can't evade death, even if you like take refuge in playing a million different characters who live and die. Sooner or later, you, the actor, the absurd person, have to die as well. And with you, all of those performances. But in a way, they've already died. You don't carry the entirety of a performance from 20 years ago with you, do you? And so this is an interesting character sketch. It's uh, not quite as direct as the one that immediately preceded of Don Juanism, but it does convey one potential consistent attitude in the face of the absurd.